connection. You have to have a, no a whole series of, of networks to tell you how much illness there is in the general population and how much of it is the tip of the iceberg, which is a very severe disease. And I don't actually know how this triangle is constructed in India. Um, the National Influenza Center for India is in the National Institute of Virology in Pune, and there are several um, centers that report to them. So what we do at the WHO collaborating centers is the WHO, all these national influenza centers report what's happening in their jurisdictions. And the reason this is important is that this is a, this is, uh, these are data that we reviewed last September, so six month, uh, four months ago. And what we have here is a, f a picture of the world with the pie chart over different countries or different regions. And this pie chart is broken up by virus subtype. So the orange is influenza B. The very light blue is influenza A, H1N1. The darker uh, green is H3. And then there's some unsubtyped. And what I want to draw your attention to is that we were sitting in Australia making the decision for what should happen in Australia. And in Australia, our epidemic was H3. There was no doubt about it. We had almost all H3. But you scoot over towards India, the Indian subcontinent had H1N1. Um, so we still don't know why there was an H1 outbreak in India and one part of Central America. Everywhere else it was an H3 year with a little bit of B. So it is important to collect information from around the world because what is happening in one population center is not necessarily what's happening elsewhere. So what we do is these 143 centers report their information, send their viruses to these five WHO collaborating centers, and there are, there are some essential regulatory labs. And what we do together is characterize those viruses. The key thing we're looking for is to say, is the virus different from what was circulating last year? So if the country, if, if any country has a vaccine program, we need to know whether the vaccine should be updated. In addition, we're looking to see whether the viruses that are circulating have become resistant to antiviral drugs. And we're also looking for any new viruses, any new infections from animal sources that might pose a pandemic threat. So those are essentially what these, what these labs do. So what, how do we characterize these viruses? We look to see by hemagglutination inhibition or virus neutralization, whether the viruses would react well with um, anti-serum raised against last year's vaccine. So we do a lot of HI and virus neutralization. We do a lot, much more now than we used to of sequencing, including full genome sequencing. We look at antiviral drug resistance. And now more and more, all the labs are also collecting information from epidemiology. So we're looking to see how much illness is out there, but we are also collecting in real time how well the vaccine is performing. So all these years, we, you know, we would re make recommendations for the vaccine, and then we would get all these calls during flu season that from doctors or patients saying that I took the vaccine and it didn't work. Now, all over the world, they're following the same method to track vaccine effectiveness, and it's been quite an eye-opener. So we also then recommend if the vaccine virus should be changed, uh, we also collect information about whether the virus grows well in eggs, because 95% of the world's vaccine is manufactured in eggs. So the, the committee meets twice a year, once in February, so it's coming up next month, for the Northern Hemisphere vaccine uh, recommendation, and in September for the Southern Hemisphere. So a few years ago, the WHO specifically looked at what about the countries in the middle band that are not clearly having a temperate northern, north, north, northern hemisphere winter or clear southern hemisphere winter. And so India, of course, falls into that category. And they did a very careful analysis. And at the end of the day, they decided that they would not have a third recommendation. Because one of the possibilities was to have a third recommendation for countries in the middle band. But what they've come up with, and there's a website that provides information, is for each country in that middle band to look at their own seasonality and their own virus um, surveillance data to decide which of the two vaccines they should go with. So India has made a decision to follow the Southern Hemisphere vaccine. 
So what we do is that we recommend a change in the vaccine only if the virus that is circulating looks different from the previous strain. There are sequence changes in the, particularly in the hemagglutinin. And all of this work is done using sera raised in ferrets. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the ferret tells you, we also collect a panel of human sera from people of different ages. So we collect sera from children, from healthy adults and from the elderly who got last year's vaccine. And we test to see whether last year's vaccine worked well. So this panel, these panels of sera are shared by all the labs. We ship them to each other and everybody tests them. So only if the, um, there's poor recognition in, of the serum panels, then we would change the, the, um, the, re the recommendation. And of course, the million dollar question is, do we have something to change too? And this is becoming more and more of a challenge with H3N2 viruses. So in September, the last decision we made was to change, but we had one choice, literally one choice. So we chose it, and then we kept our fingers crossed that it would actually turn out okay. Um, so it, this is becoming a big problem. So the WHO system recommends what should go into the vaccine, but then that decision is taken back to each country and each country's national regulatory authorities decide whether to accept the recommendation. Now I'll tell you that most people do, but it is, it's not a decision that's imposed, it's uh, recommended. So this is just, I don't expect you to see the details in the back, but this top is H1N1, the middle is H3N2, and the bottom is flu B. And this is just time from 2000 to 2017, southern and northern hemisphere, to show you how often we've changed the vaccine recommendation. So we do change the vaccine strains um, at e for each of the four components fairly often, but never have all four strains been changed at the same time. So this is a very busy slide to show you all of that happens. So we get an original clinical sample from a throat swab or a nasal swab. We inoculate that into embryonated hen's eggs. We collect the virus and then characterize the virus by hemagglutination. And then we select a vaccine strain. It has to be reassorted to make a virus grow to high yield in eggs. That is then manufactured by um, the pharmaceutical industry packaged and delivered. So this process takes six months. And that's why the decision is made in February for vaccination given in September, and we make a decision for the Southern Hemisphere in September for vaccine that's available the following March or April. So this is the composition of the 2018 Southern Hemisphere where we changed two strain, uh, we changed one strain in the quadrivalent and we swapped out which of the two flu Bs would be in the um, trivalent. So I mentioned that we are now collecting information on how well the vaccine is performing. This is called vaccine effectiveness. So um, these are studies that are done. They're an interesting um, model that is used. And what they're doing, this is being done uniformly now across the world um, using the same method, and it's called the test negative design. So this, what they do is they select hospitals or practices where they're going to study people over the se flu season. And they ask people that come to these clinics whether they have an influenza-like illness. So if they meet the, a certain definition, they get a throat swab. If the throat swab is positive for flu, then they fall into the flu positive category. If they came with the same symptoms but are test negative, they serve as the controls. So now you're no longer biased by whether somebody is seeking healthcare. Everybody who's coming in that meets that definition is swabbed and divided into flu positive or flu negative. And then you ask those two groups, were you vaccinated? So the vaccine effectiveness is based on the odds that you were vaccinated and protected from flu versus vaccinated and not protected. So we would normally, yes? Vaccinated when? That season. No, we don't count that. So this season, were you vaccinated? Um, and so we would like to see vaccine effectiveness at 50% or greater. And what we see in different, these are different studies done in the US and in different populations, inpatient, outpatient. And you can see that the final vaccine effectiveness in the 2016-2017 season was very poor. 
Um, and in fact, the, in Australia, the overall vaccine effectiveness last season, the interim numbers were 33%, but then when you teased it out against H3, it was only 10%. Um, and in the elderly, the people we really want to protect against influenza, it was below zero. So we are now paying a lot of attention to vaccine effectiveness because we have the tools to do so. So there are lots of limitations of the current influenza vaccines. The, the efficacy in, in the elderly is poor. There's a relatively short duration of protection, partly because of antigenic drift, but also even when they are matched well, even if we've guessed right, as Raghavan said, even then the vaccines are not terribly effective. And then we've got the possibility that we've just guessed wrong because we make the decision six months ahead and the virus is continuing to evolve in nature. Um, and so we certainly had those instances where a decision's made and three months later you have a new variant that is spreading like wildfire and then you have to decide what to do. So a few, several years ago in the US they actually made a decision and then a few months later there was a new strain that was spreading and they, made, they decided to add a monovalent vaccine to protect against that strain. So occasionally you get that sort of thing. But the whole process takes many months. So what are our options for improving influenza vaccines? So we, I mean, I think there's general agreement that we need something better. Um, what we have in the optimal circumstances, if you're a young, healthy adult um, and you get vaccinated and the vaccine's a good match, we expect to see between 60, 30, 60 to 80% vaccine effectiveness. Usually we're seeing numbers, especially with H3, that are much lower. So what could we do to get, make it better? We could improve the breadth of protection by adding an adjuvant, and people have used MF59 or ASO3, which are oil and water adjuvants. They seem to work very well. You could try prime boost strategies, which I've spent a lot of my career trying to look at. You could try computationally optimizing an antigen, so you take, keep track of all the possible changes and, and make, create a new HA synthetically um, that covers all of those changes. And then there, there's, there are people that, want, that introduce combinations of antigens. So the Jenner Institute, for instance, is using an NP plus M1 um, or T cell epitope vaccine. But there's a lot of interest in what's being called a game changer approach or a universal vaccine. And that is to say, you're not going to just simply update each year. You're gonna start with a completely new strategy. And the, what, that focuses most of its attention on the HA stem. So the, there are a number of targets for universal vaccines. Probably the most optimistic uh, or the furthest ahead is the HA. So the hemagglutinin is a, uh, is a trimer um, with a, a very conserved stem and a highly variable head. So everything in red on this schematic is highly variable, and this yellow is a conserved stem. So there's a lot of interest in developing stem, antibody, uh, stem um, vaccines, and it's based in large part on this sort of phylogenetic relationship between all the different HAs that are out there. They fall into two groups, group one and group two, largely based, grouped on the conservation in the stem. So there are many challenges to trying to develop a stem vaccine. Some of the technical challenges are to identify targets that are conserved across a wide range of influenza viruses, to develop a vaccine strategy that induces an immune response that is sufficiently robust to protect against infection, because the argument is that if we had a robust response to natural infection, we wouldn't need, we wouldn't ever be reinfected. So clearly we have to do better than natural infection is doing in order to elicit something that is robust in protection. It has to be elicited at the appropriate site. So one of the arguments against a T cell based vaccine is that it shouldn't produce immunopathology. So you need a response at the site where infection is going to take place um, without adverse events. From the regulatory standpoint, the big challenge is finding immune correlates of protection. Because right now we have a measure of hemagglutination inhibition antibody that the regulators follow. So you don't have to do a clinical trial each time you change the, the flu vaccine. Um, and then in implementation, who should be vaccinated, how often, and when? So is it something that we would have to revaccinate people every ten, five years, every 10 years? 
Would you vaccinate a birth cohort at a time? So there are lots of, you know, sort of public health questions about how you would do this. So I'm not going to talk about um, antiviral drugs, but I will now switch, I hope. So one of the things that I wanted to talk a little bit more about are the uh, novel influenza viruses that can cross into people. So I've talked to you about seasonal influenza and how we deal with that, but we are also concerned about novel viruses that come into the human population from avian reservoirs or swine reservoirs. So as I said, till about 20 years ago, we believed that human influenza viruses would not infect people unless they reassorted. But we followed now for many years, there were case reports, but now in these two boxed areas are H5N1 and H7N9 infections that are avian influenza viruses that have infected people. They've caused a tremendous amount of case fatal very high case fatality rates, um, but neither of these viruses have spread eff effectively from person to person. We're most concerned right now about H7N9 viruses. So this is an epidemic curve, looking at the case counts on the left, on the y-axis, and time since the first appearance of these viruses in 2013 to, to 2017. And in blue are cases, and in red are deaths. So in 2017, the fifth wave of these viruses was a bigger wave than all the previous four years combined. So we see this virus coming back each year in larger and larger numbers, so far uh, limited to China. So the goal of a uh, pandemic influenza vaccine would be to protect against these strains, but there's a huge diversity in nature. And so there are a number of different strategies that are being used to try to make vaccines against these viruses. So I'm going to switch now and talk to you uh, about what makes a pandemic influenza virus uh, uh, successful, epidemi epidemiologically successful. So what I've said before is with H5N1 and H7N9, we now know clearly that certain avian influenza viruses can infect people. We have huge numbers of people that have been infected, documented infections, but they're not spreading from person to person. So what we were interested in understanding was what are the molecular determinants of influenza transmission. So this work was done by Seema Laktawala, who was a postdoc in my lab when I was at the NIH. So how does influenza transmit? So there's clearly direct transmission, um, and it's done through uh, in the absence of a contaminated surface or involving a contaminated surface. Somebody coughs or sneezes, and then you happen to touch that surface. You've got influenza virus on your fingers, and you can transmit it. But also we're concerned about respiratory transmission. And this is a very famous image of a sneeze, and it shows that the larger particles fall out of the air fairly, in a fairly short distance. So within one meter, three feet, those particles drop. But the smaller particles remain suspended in the air. They are less than five microns in size, and they can pass your epiglottis and go into the deeper airways. So, it's very hard to distinguish between these two droplet sizes, so people usually lump it together and say that's respiratory transmission. So several labs in the US and um, China, uh, Japan and Europe have started studying the transmissibility of influenza viruses, because we do not understand what makes one influenza virus transmit by air and another not. And we believe that this is a very important bit of information for telling us when an H5N1 or H7N9 virus is a cause for concern, or when the pandemic H, uh, 2009 virus was so successful. So the, the system that most of us use, and it's not standardized, so I'll describe the system. Um, conceptually, we all use the same sort of thing, but there's no standard in the field. And that is to infect a ferret intranasally. You put them in one half of a cage. Ferrets are very social animals, and they will curl up and sleep together. So if you separate them, by a steel mesh. So some people use a steel mesh. We use two steel um, perforated steel barriers. And you could just slide them in and divide the cage. 
Now, 24 hours after you infected this ferret, you put in a naive ferret next door. And you have air coming through, passing over the infected ferret, over the naive ferret, and then it gets HEPA filtered out. So, in theory, this ferret is only going to become infected if they get infected from the experimentally infected ferret. So we, we do four to six cages at a time. Um, and then you do nasal washes on the ferrets every other day and look for the amount of virus. So what we did um, was that the, the dogma in the field was that an avian influenza virus would only become transmissible in humans if the receptor changed to bind the mammalian sialic acid receptor. And there were two very controversial but very interesting papers in the field that really brought influenza um, research and transmissibility and virulence to a halt when they took H5N1 viruses and made them transmissible in humans. So we decided to take, an, take a different approach. And what this receptor binding pocket of each of the three trimers is circled up here. And human influenza viruses bind sialic acids with the two six-linked um, glycans. And avian influenza viruses preferentially bind influenza viruses with two three-linked sialic acids. So what the, the, um, the dogma in the field was that association with two six sialic acids was required for transmissibility. And we decided to start with the 2009 virus that was clearly successful in transmitting. And we said, what if we avianized it? What if we took out the 2,6 binding, made it a 2,3 binder, and then saw whether it would transmit? And so we did this following work that had been done previously with the 1918 strain by Peter Palazzi's lab, where they, the South Carolina 18, which was the virus that was resurrected from um, cadavers um, by Jeff Taubenberger, that was an bound to six sialic acids, and they avianized it by changing these four residues. The 2009 virus is very similar to the 1918, so we follow the same strategy to make a 2-6 and 2-3 binder. And this is work we did in collaboration with Ram Sessi Sekran at MIT uh, to look at the glycan binding. So this is a limited glycan array where the colors in the red spectrum are 2-6 binders, so short chain and long chain uh, sialic acid, 2,6 linked. And in blue are the short, medium, and extra long chain, 2,3 sialic acids. So the wild type H1N1 virus binds 2,6 sialic acid, so it binds the orange and red spectrum. We avianized it, and this bound, as we predicted, bound the 2,3 sialic acids. So we infected ferrets with these viruses and found that they, they replicated similarly um, in ferrets. So we said, OK, how will they transmit? So these are data from the 2.6 H1N1 virus. In yellow are the animals that we experimentally infected. So all the animals, that three, four animals that we experimentally infected became infected. And these are their neighbors. In three out of the four pairs, there was transmission. This was not a surprise, this is what we expected. This is our positive control. So then we infected animals with the 2 3 linked sialic acid binder. Prediction is it would not transmit. Unfortunately, it did transmit. It transmitted just as well. So this was a surprise. Um, and we then looked at the data and realized that the transmission was delayed with the 2 3 binder. So we wondered whether the virus had actually changed, and that's what allowed it to transmit. So here we um, did deep sequencing, and this was something a reviewer made us do. Um, and it was a good thing once you calm down and stop being angry at the reviewer. Sometimes it's actually very informative. And so we sequenced the, um, the inoculum. So in the inoculum, we had four amino acid changes. There were five nucleotides that contributed to these four amino acid changes. They're all shown in blue. So anything in blue is the engineered change we put in. What we found when we sequenced the virus that transmitted to the recipient ferret that should have been all blue, one of the residues was a complete revertent. So we then asked whether this reversion occurred in the animal that became infected or whether it emerged from the animal that we experimentally infected. And you can see that there's a gradual buildup of reversion in the experimentally infected ferret. 
so we then um, we named this revertin virus, the revertant, and then we asked whether the receptor binding changed. So just to remind you, the virus that we started with, that we had engineered, bound to three linked sialic acids, the revertant did not lose the 2-3 binding, but it now gained long chain 2-6 binding. So that was, went against one part of the dogma in the field, that you had to lose 2-3 binding and gain 2-6. Here we showed that you had to gain 2-6, but you didn't have to lose 2-3. But then we asked whether we could identify where in the respiratory tract this revertant emerged. So this is a diagram of the ferret respiratory tree where we collected samples from. And again, now I'm showing you the data only from that one residue, only the re residue in question that flips around. So that, the inoculum was pure. And then we started looking at samples. These, each bar represents one animal. And we're looking at the proportion of reads that where there's reversion. So if it's all blue, it stays, it stays um, as the engineered nucleotide. If there's any orange, it's a reversion. So in the nasal wash, days one, three, five, and seven, there's reversion in all of the animals. Nasal turbinates, lungs, BAL, trachea, and then the big surprise was the soft palate, where already by day one, and certainly by day three, it's completely enriched for the revert. And my postdoc, who actually collected these samples, had no idea what a soft palate was. She just had the animal open and she collected everything. And so when we saw this data, I said, show me what you collected. <laughs> Nobody looks at the soft palate. So this was completely a surprise. In humans, we never collect soft palate tissue. So we have no idea what happens there. So what is the soft palate? For those of you that don't know your anatomy any more than Seema did, the soft palate, if you run your tongue along the roof of your mouth and you feel the hard surface, keep going back until you start gagging. That's the soft palate, okay? So the soft palate has two surfaces. It forms the roof of the mouth and the floor of the nasopharynx. And there are two mucosal surfaces and in between they're submucosal glands. So the nasopharyngeal surface, which is the floor of the nasopharynx, has respiratory mucosa and the roof of the oral cavity has squamous epithelium. And in between, you have these mucosal glands. So what we did was we, we looked at what, ha where, what sorts of flu receptors there were. What are the sialic acids that are present on the soft palate? So this is lectin binding. And the green are 2,6 binders. And the red are 2,3. And you can see that the soft palate has largely 2,6 binding sialic acids. The submucosal glands have both, with a lot of 2,6. This, the oral cavity side has virtually nothing going on. So Ram Sasi Sekaran had a probe for long chain 2,6. So we use that and you see that the respiratory mucosa, this, the respiratory epithelium, is like a carpet of long chain 2,6. And the submucosal glands are loaded with long chain 2,6. So we believe that is where the selection occurred. So again, reviewer number three is not satisfied and says, can you tell me that this is something that is just not unique to a ferret? So that sent us into overdrive because we had to try to find tissues from other species and look at the soft palate. So there are no tissue banks that carry soft palate. You can call around, nothing. So Seema had interviewed for a job at a vet school. So she contacted those folks and they sent her pig tissue. And then I called my old friends and colleagues and found human tissue. And that's a whole different story. But what we found was both in the pigs and in humans, as in ferrets, the soft palate has a sheet of long chain 2,6 binding. And it's present less so in the um, submucosal glands. But there's this, um, pre this long chain 2,6 is highly conserved. So what do we think is happening? Now, this is where, this is where we speculate that in the uninfected tissue, this is an image of what the respiratory epithelium looks like. And you'll see it's um, ciliated cells on the respiratory epithelium. That's what these arrows are. And this is what the uninfected submucosal glands look like. In an infected animal, you see a loss, a lot of desquamation, lots of inflammation. The cells are destroyed. They're shed off. And the submucosal glands are just full of inflammation. So what we speculate is happening, and, and we also know that the, 
soft palate is innervated by the trigeminal nerve. So what we speculate is happening is that there's not a lot of room, but when there's a lot of inflammation and that carpet of long chain 2,6 infected cells are desquamated, and there's a lot of inflammation in the submucosal glands, it probably triggers coughing and sneezing, and that may propel these infected cells that are desquamated. So that's the hand-waving part. We don't know if that's actually true. But to summarize, virus, uh, viruses with a 2-3 binding preference rapidly adapt in the respiratory tract of ferrets, and viruses that gain 2-6 bind, binding haven't lost 2-3 binding. And we found that the soft palate is an important site for adaptation of transmissible influenza viruses. So we've added to this story of what is involved in um, airborne transmission of influenza viruses. So this part of the work was done by Seema Laktawala, primarily in the lab, with a lot of collaboration with MIT, with Ramsay Sekharan and Akhila Jairaman. We did the deep sequencing with Dave Wentworth when he was at the, at the um, GCVI, and the funding was through the um, Division of Intramural Research at the NIH. And let me see if I can go back to my acknowledgement slide here. So just to go back to the original story, um, I wanted to close by saying that these are the sorts of images that, that come up every time there's a pandemic flu threat. Um, but preparing for seasonal influenza is what is going to help us when the next pandemic or potential pandemic appears. And what we do from learning to prepare for a future pandemic also enriches our ability to respond to seasonal influenza. This is a picture from my new job um, at the um, WHO Collaborating Center for Influenza in Melbourne um, at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity. So with that, I'll close and see if you have any questions. Thank you. So we're now looking at the data in preparation for the Northern Hemisphere vaccine strain selection. And I can tell you sort of from the one bit of data that we've seen that the US and Europe are seeing a lot of H3. Mm -hmm. China's seeing a lot of flu B, hardly any H3. Japan's seeing H1N1 and B. So what happens in one part of the world does not necessarily happen elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so having good surveillance is really important. Um, and there seems to be a pocket of a lot of H1 in the Indian subcontinent. So last year we didn't have a lot of data from India, but we did from Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And the Maldives had a big outbreak um, and they sent viruses along. So, you know, the say, it's not one, one answer fits all. One problem I've heard, and I don't, don't have the, da the facts about this, is that one of the reasons there's so much talk of H1N1 in India mm -hmm. is that a lot of labs only have primers for H1N1. Mm -hmm. So they're not looking sufficiently for H3. They haven't updated their diagnostic tests. So I don't know if that's true, but I've been told that by several people, that they're not looking equally hard for H3. So when they report H1 only, we don't know if there's ac actually some H3 as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's much worse. Much worse. Yeah, so H3 epidemics tend to be very severe compared to H1, partly because people, um, older people, people over 50, 55, have had a prior experience with H1 viruses that were very similar. So even during the H1 pandemic, we did not see a lot of deaths in the elderly. We saw a lot of deaths in young, healthy adults and children but not much in, in, in the elderly. Mm 
H3, in contrast, affects people of the entire age spectrum, and it's particularly bad in the elderly. So normally, H3 epidemics are very severe. H1's not so much. How is the sequence similarity between the two? Oh, they're, to call it a new subtype has to be at least 20% amino acid difference. Mm -hmm. So there's very little cross, there's no, virtually no cross protection. So that's a good question. I don't know that it was. Um, so what, I, what we haven't been able to figure out, we were just looking at transmissibility, okay? So what transmitted was the revertent virus. The experimentally infected animals had both present, and it was only in the soft palate that was highly enriched. So what I don't know to this day, and I've been trying to figure out how to answer this question, is whether the infected animal had preferentially enriched in the soft palate and only that came across to, the, to its naive neighbor, or whether everything came across and the first particles that land or enriched are in the soft palate, and that's the virus that wins. So I don't know whether a quasi-species came over and was selected in the naive an in the recipient, or whether what came across was already selected for in the experimentally infected animal. And I haven't figured out how to answer that question. Um, Ma'am, are there uh, efforts to reduce the six months time period for the generation of the vaccine? Um, we'd love to see that happen. Um, it's some of it is kind of structurally built in um, because vaccines are manufactured in eggs. Um, and so there's now a bit of an effort to have a recombinant vaccine, recombinant HA, which should be something that may be uh, possible to shorten that window. Um, and there's also now a cell culture based vaccine that's licensed in the US. So there may be ways to squeeze that, that number down um, some of it is regulatory efforts because they actually have to make reagents for the new vaccine to quantify the amount of HA. So people are looking at shaving off a week here, a week there, and try to compress that timeline. But on the flip side, even if it's available sooner, um, I am worried that it's being given too soon. So now in Australia, for instance, the vaccine is available in March. And as soon as they advertise that it's available, Everybody flocks to get their vaccine. Um, and the elderly are the first to get it. Now, if you have a late season and the antibody titers have dropped off, they may now be more susceptible than we would have liked. So we're now doing a study to say, when, when should you vaccinate? Should you vaccinate as soon as it's available or should you vaccinate closer to when the predicted season is? The trouble in public health is that people are very risk averse and we don't want to ever be caught having made a vaccine that's sitting in our, in our, on our shelves and hasn't been given to people and the season starts early. So if the window can be shortened, what I'd like to see happen is the decisions made later rather than the decision still being made early but we make the vaccine too early. Thank you. Yeah, since I'm here, <laughs> <laughs> you can ask a question that will save your life. <laughs> yeah, my question was are there any mutations that skew the expression of the two types of sialic acid that determine the receptor preference? So, the sialic acid, the 2,6 yeah, versus... Yeah, 2,3. Are there any mutations that affect the relative expression? Mutations in the host or mutations in the virus? Either. So we don't know of... So we don't... We know which mutations in the hemagglutinin preferentially bind 2,3. Right. 
or preferentially bind to six. We don't know of any that encode sort of equal usage of the two. What happened in our revertent virus is that because we had engineered a mutation at 187, that allowed 2-3 binding, and the reversion at 222 allowed 2-6 binding. So by creating this mix, we had something that bound both. Okay? So most people in the flu field want to stay away from 2-3 binding. So we wouldn't want to, unless, unless it allows for better replication in eggs. So what happens when you inoculate a virus into eggs that we use for manufacture is probably there are some mutations that, that occur in order to bind to 3 sialic acids better. So maybe that would accelerate production if we could engineer in mutations that allow 2,3 and 2,6 dual binding. Mm -hmm. But right now, all of that would be based on reverse genetics, and that's locked up in uh, patent rights. Mm. So in the human population, are there any polymorphisms that uh, affect the expression, I mean, the glycosylation pattern to skew in one or the other direction? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, know, we know relatively little about where in the respiratory tract the relative proportions of 2,3 and 2,6 binders are. So one of the problems in our field is people make blanket statements that oversimplify the field. So they've always said there's 2,6 receptor, receptors in your upper respiratory tract and there are 2,3 receptors in the lower. And they've said that the reason avian influenza viruses have caused so much mortality is that they bind 2,3 receptors which are present in the lungs, deep in the lungs, and therefore people get sicker and die. I've always had a problem with this because when you identify H5N1 or H7N9 infections in China or anywhere that they occur, they're done with throat swabs. We're not going into their lungs, they're throat swabs. So clearly there is 2,3 binding virus present. So there was a beautiful paper done by people from the University of Hong Kong where they actually did mass spec and said, taking cells and tissue from different parts of the respiratory tree, what are the glycans, pre what glycans are present? And we all look at these glycans based on arrays, my, arrays that have been developed that are sort of, um, they're synthetic glycans. Mm -hmm. So they looked at what is present in the respiratory tree of humans, and then they've looked at the glycan arrays and said, which array is, is most informative? It turns out none of the arrays really reflect what is present in the respiratory tract. Um, and the respiratory tract actually has a mixture, and they also have a lot of sulfated glycans, and a lot of glycans that are just not, you know, they don't fit this paradigm. Mm -hmm. They've also identified a difference by age. So the children have a slightly different receptor specificity than adults. So I think that's an area that is wide open for research and will be very informative in the future. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't fit the easy paradigm that the field has pushed. Okay, I just have a couple of questions. So if viral evolution happens so fast, like in a few days in ferrets or so rapidly in eggs, then you know that's a real problem for, for a vaccine, right? Because uh, this even if the people are vaccinated, you will have evolution. Right. Also, it seems like when you have populations which are at least vaccinated to a significant extent and ones which are not, the, um, the pattern of evolution will be different. And so the kind of vaccines that you give, you know, they, they may not be uh, equally uh, Effective. Yeah, so, so I think the second part is true. I mean, there's a lot of, dis what we don't know very much about is whether people that have mild infections, which you would have if you were vaccinated, we hope, whether they, they transmit virus or not. Do asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic people transmit virus? We don't have a good handle on that. We think they can, probably to close contacts, but clearly the sicker you are, the more high titer virus you have, the more likely you are to transmit it. But there are probably people with fairly low grade virus that may or may not transmit. And so one of the arguments, I mean, I worked a lot on live attenuated vaccine and part of that idea was that if you had a mucosal immune response as well as a T cell response, you might actually be better protected and might transmit less. Mm 
Um, so it's hard to know in a population where vaccine is used very little, um, how much that drives evolution. But certainly your immune response drives the HA to change. And the live attenuated vaccines haven't done that well. In, in, in they haven't done well in the in US. The They've done, is, yeah. So it's a very complicated story in the US. So the data for um, the live attenuated vaccine in efficacy studies, which is prospective study, you bring in people, you vaccinate them with live vaccine or killed vaccine, you follow them through the season, and you document anyone who has an illness, you document whether it's flu or not. So in efficacy studies, live was better than killed in children, no question. Effectiveness studies are, you don't know, you just look at how the vaccine performs in the real world. And what happened with the live vaccine in the US was vaccine effectiveness in the last few years has dropped off against H1N1 pdm 9 Why did that happen? I think it's a, I think it's a perfect storm. They went from, went into a quadrivalent preparation that has four different strains at seven logs delivered in 0.2 mils in nasal spray. You are expecting all four strains to hit the respiratory epithelium and replicate in the same sort of curve, same fashion. I think the pandemic H1N1 virus is slow out of the box. So by the time the B viruses have infected the epithelium, maybe the H3, H1 has just no room to go. So the vaccine has essentially failed in children against H1N1 PDM09. Now, the Europe, now that, those were the data in the US. The Europeans, the Canadians did not find these data. And so in England, they have a program to use live vaccine in young children, school-aged children and younger. And their data looks fantastic. Now, I don't know whether the company will stay in business without the US market. Um, and so, so I think, unfortunately, the, the UK data alone may not be sufficient. The live vaccine made in India is based on the Russian backbone. And that is a little hotter than the Ann Arbor vaccine that's used in the US. And they have not had exactly the same problems. But I think even the Indian live vaccine manufacturers are very nervous about what they're seeing in the US. Okay, <laughs> I was going to ask if this uh, same vaccine was used in the US and in the UK yeah. and Canada. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much. So please join us at